Now I'm shearing under underwater here uh, because if I turn this light on, you won't see the pictures. And uh, if you see the pictures, I can't read my notes. So I have here an ancient way of dealing with this, but you'll excuse me for a few some stumbles. Despite that, I'm very glad to be here. And as Jaime says, uh, especially in this lecture theatre, which is named after my wife's uncle, Arthur Webster, whose portrait, as I'm sure you know, is just outside the theatre. As I talk, I'm going to use as a shorthand uh, 1788. And that's a phrase which is shorthand for that moving uh, frontier of contact between Aborigines and other people, which be be began at Sydney Cove in 1788 and then expanded across the country for the next 140 odd years. So it's a shorthand for that. It's obviously a movable time. I'm going to start with this image. It's a eucalypt, obviously. In their responses to light and space and fire, plants record their history. And eucalypts store more history than most. Their shape shows whether they grew in the forest or in the open. Locally, their size sorts them by generation. And each generation's size shape and distribution announces the vegetation history of its sur surrounds, whether this was open or dense forest or first one and then the other. Seeing trees by their shape and by generation can show dramatic changes, particularly where grass or woodland later became forest. This can flag a locality 1788 and colonial past. This tree is a swamp gum from Tasmania, taken in 2011. Most of us uh, know uh, swamp gum as Mount Nash, the mainland word for the same tree. And we know Mount Nash as dense forests of tall, straight trees. A fire rages, the whole forest dies, in the rich ash thousands of seedlings race up to get light and tall forest returns. But this Mount Nash is obviously not like that. It's spread because it's always stood in the open. How can that be? A bushfire would kill it and replace it with swathes of competing seedlings, as, as we see. Uh, whereas without fire, this is rainforest land, as perhaps you can just see in the background. Only centuries of control fire could burn back that rainforest without ever touching this fire sensitive tree. Mount Nash is probably the most sensitive, fire sensitive of all eucalypts. So this is one example where what we might call a natural plant cycle has been interrupted. You can see the same thing in many places with Cary in Western Australia and also where eucalypts are capturing ancient grassland and under their cover, rainforest encroaches. If you fly from Sydney to Brisbane, for example, and look carefully along the mountain ridges, you can see rainforest coming in under those eucalypts. Thanks very much for closing the door. So, rainforest is encroaching, and it follows, therefore, that without fire, those places grow rainforest. Only determined and repeated fire could have made them grass in 1788, sometimes probably by mere metres at a time. Those fires are no more, and so rainforest returns. Colonial words and paintings and survey plans depicting land tell the same story. Many show 1788 grassland, which is now eucalypt forest. And the obvious question to ask is, why only now? Why not then? Some researchers say that bushfire converted pre-1788 forest to grass, but after a bushfire, scrub comes back more, not less, and bushfire rarely clears big eucalypts. They re-sprout from, uh, put, put on what they are called beards, leaves along the trunks, and they soon recover the dominance they had before the fire. 
only repeated fire, clearing seedling and sapling for centuries until the old trees die out, converts eucalypts to grass and only people make such fire. Forest regeneration is so evident now, at least if you look, because people favoured grass in 1788. Grassland carried many useful plants and most animals with most meat. It was a fire break, it made seeing and travelling easier and it confined forest, making forest resources more predictable. Almost always it took the best soil, probably there was more grass then than now and if there was an imbalance in Aboriginal plant distribution it was a slight extension of grassland into forest or scrub, that is small encroachments by fire that was marginally out of control. In short, for over 220 years, the land has been shouting at us newcomers that we've got it wrong. The country was not natural, but made. Aborigines made it by using fire or no fire to distribute plants and plant distribution to position animals. Giving plants and animals ideal conditions made them abundant. Carefully distributing their habitats made them convenient and predictable. This was possible because most Australian plants tolerate fire and because in Australia, almost uniquely, the only large predators to disturb prey were people. Most of us now accept what Rhys Jones neatly called fire stick farming fire stick farming, that is patch burning grass to bring on fresh growth to lure grazing animals. A few early newcomers noted this. At Albany and WA, George Vancouver observed in 1791, fire is frequently resorted to by rude nations, either for the purpose of encouraging a sweeter growth of herbage in their hunting grounds, or as tools for taking the wild animals of which they're in pursuit. In northwest Tasmania, Henry Hellyer remarked in 1828, it's possible that the natives, by burning only one set of planes, are enabled to keep the kangaroos more concentrated for their use, and I can in no way account for their burning only in this place unless it is to serve them as a hunting place. Aborigines themselves stated at Evans Bay in 1849, Observing that the grass had been burnt on portions of the flats, the blacks said that the rain that was coming on would make the young grass spring up and that would bring down the kangaroos and the blacks would spear them from the scrub. Evans Bay is next to Torres Strait. It's as far from Albany and Tasmania as you can get in Australia and yet all three people manage land similarly. Evans Bay is also next to islanders who gardened. People could compare their management with Torres Strait agriculture, but if they did try gardening, they abandoned it. It's possible they tried it because there are exotic uh, plant species on Cape York uh, from which you could get food, uh, but uh, Aboriginal people were not using them at the time of contact. Instead, they matched the rest of the content, continent choosing a course that they thought more efficient and reliable. In 1845, Ludwig Leichhardt called this choice a systematic management, a systematic management of their country. The choice made large-scale gardening impossible because people allied with fire. About 70% of Australia's plant species tolerate or encourage fire. And that's a key fact about Australia. Trees and bushes reseed or re-sprout, while dominant fodder grasses are perennial. So unlike Europe's fodder annuals, they reshoot. In, in other words, they refuel. 1788's first fire task was to control fuel by ceremony and by constant careful burning. This let people prevent the terrible killer fires which have immolated the fringes of every Australian capital except Darwin in recent decades. Fires which must have decimated people in 1788. 
Think to yourselves how impossible it would have been for people to have run from those uh, Melbourne 2009 fires and then ask why Aboriginal people did not have to run from such fires, why their genealogies are continuous in that country. It's because regular fires prevented irregular fires. Instead of the slogan of my youth, which was prevent bushfires, nailed up to every big tree, the rule was a fire a day keeps bushfires away. Taming fire was a great achievement, one which we have managed. It was also caused to manage every corner of the continent. There was no wilderness, no terra nullius in 1788. That is a European invention after 1788. Edward Eyre observed in 1841, no part of the country is so utterly worthless as not to have attractions sufficient occasionally to tempt the wandering savage into its recesses. The very regions which in the eyes of the European are most barren and worthless, are to the native the most valuable and productive. And so to every place the fire stick came. Of course, people burnt the most useful land most and sterile or sensitive land, perhaps not for generations. But sooner or later, they burnt everywhere. If fuel built up, it was burnt. And this unleashed rich possibilities. I'm going to list uh, stages in moving from fuel reduction to managing country. One, the more fuel is reduced, the more easily is fire controlled, and so the more useful it is. Two, even hot fires leave unburnt patches, but the cooler the fire, the bigger the patches. Three, patches benefit animals by joining burnt to unburnt country. Burnt is feed country, unburnt is shelter country. Four, patches form mosaics, which can be adjusted in size by varying fire intensity. Five, intensity can be regulated by fire frequency and fire timing. Six, frequency and timing are local. They depend on local flora and local moderators like rain, wind, temperature and aspect. And seven, the better people understand these variables, the more they can burn with purpose. They can move from just limiting fuel to shaping country. And eight, this lets them selectively locate fire tolerant and fire sensitive plants, situate mosaics and resources conveniently and predictably and arrange them so that one supplies what another does not. Now, local variations in managing fire to achieve those eight steps, I think, are many and obvious. You can never burn rainforest in the same way as spinifex, and, the, and in the north you can rarely burn during the wet, whereas in the south there are opportunities year-round. But everywhere the basic purposes of fire were the same. To limit fuel, to ensure diversity and abundance, to regulate plant and animal populations. The plant patterns that people made with fire were the same too. Grass on good soil, forest split by grass, tree and scrub clumps in grassland, undergrowth uncommon. And the benefits were the same. Plants and animals were located predictably and conveniently. Now, so carefully was fire managed and so great its impact that we might easily uh, miss its obvious corollary, which is no fire. A conscious decision not to burn also regulates plants and animals. People judged equally what to burn and what not, when, how often and how hot. So fire and no fire work together. And this is not simply fire stick farming. To my dismay, some readers think my book merely elaborates fire stick farming. They mistake my case and they diminish the beauty and complexity of what people were doing in 1788. When you think about it, fire stick farming is an end point. It's a harvesting. It activated grass or reed patches by 
burning a patch, waiting a fortnight until the grass came on green and so on. But it did that on land that had already been made grassland, already been made by very different fire regimes, sometimes long before. Proof of its limits lies in how much 1788 fire did not suit it. For example, people made some grassland to keep animals off and so they never patch burnt it to, uh, for fresh growth to attract animals. Yam daisy, for example, it's a staple, a, tu a tuber and a, a staple. It grows amid the same rich grass which best lures uh, grazing animals and kangaroos love it, yet it flourished in millions in 1788. There are accounts of the flower, the uh, yam daisy turning the country yellow from Melbourne to Mount Gambier. Flourished in millions. And there it is on the prime grassland that you'd expect to be regularly burnt. Fire also thinned or distributed forest and scrub which might never be patch burnt. While along forest edges, people might let grass grow and dry and then in the right season, in, sorry, then in the right wind, fire it hot to drive uh, prey to waiting hunters. It's gone off here, but not there. That's a relief. This is Joseph Lysett, Aborigines using fire to hunt kangaroos about 1820. And you can see in that uh, dense forest rising from the low ground between grassy hills. So you notice the very sharp edges between the forest and the grass. And then those flames are driving kangaroos up the slope, which is a disadvantage for them, up the slope towards people who are waiting with waiting spears up there. Okay. In other words, those hunters are not chancing on game. They're not hoping that the game will appear. They're predicting when and where it will come and they're waiting for them. They're also protecting the forest, firing its lee edge so that the wind takes the flames into the grass. If the wind lay the other way, they could burn the opposite edge, which you can see in centre left of the, of the image. So skillful burning is keeping the forest dense for shelter, the grass clear for feed and the game convenient. These are people who go expecting uh, to get the food that they're looking for. Now you use that in relatively uh, uh, dry country, not in rainforest, but near Brisbane, John Matthew saw the reverse technique that you use for very dense forest. There he said, hunters fire the grass in a line from one projecting point of the scrub to another and force the game away to a corner formed by the scrub margin so that the game obliged to seek shelter in the scrub became easy marks for the persons posted along its edge. In other words, you burn into the forest, driving the ruse into ambush uh, by people waiting along the edge of the dense forest. When early travellers came to that dense forest, they cursed it. In fact, in 1788, People laced such forests with paths and clearings, but in any case, many plants and animals prefer it, so naturally Aboriginal people made it a habitat. The value of dense eucalypt forests was strikingly demonstrated in January 1798, when the first fleet emancipist and initiated man John Wilson led an expedition from Sydney southwest through Bargo Brush soon to become notorious for its poor soil and stringy bark, which is to say the same thing, and its tangles of scrub and fallen timber. He got as far as Maroolan, by the way, near, near Goulburn. This is 1798. Maroolan is well past those uh, blue mountains so famously crossed in, in 1813. And he knew his way around. In one memorable week, that party noted the first koala, the first lyrebird, the first gangang cockatoo, and the first mainland wombat recorded by a European. The gangang was new to Wilson, 
but he knew the wombat and the koala, giving their Aboriginal names, probably their Blue Mountains names, uh, wombat and kalawan, from which no doubt uh, koala derives, if you pronounce it. He knew the lyrebird, but he called it a pheasant, which perhaps is why today it has no familiar name, although there is a pheasant's nest on the uh, Melbourne Road, the road to Canberra, uh, about where Wilson saw it. The point about all this is that no one in Sydney, no one in a settlement thirsty to discover, no one in a settlement where you could make a fortune by finding new animals and flogging them to scientists, no one had reported these creatures. Their country was that dense forest, bad, formidable, seeming untouched. But Wilson knew them because Aborigines valued them and they made or left habitats for their benefit. Where a purpose is apparent, I call plant communities uh, deliberately associated, such as you can see on the screen, the uh, forest and the grass, I call those communities templates. Dense forest or swamp margins are as much templates as grass forest associations for fire stick farming, but no matter which plant communities dominated locally, similar templates for similar purposes recurred across Australia. From spinifex to rainforest, from Tasmania to the Kimberleys, people associated food plants and shelter plants. By selecting optimum conditions on templates and not nearby, they made target plants and animals on them abundant, convenient and predictable. They then activated the templates in plan rotation according to season and circumstance. So they knew where their resources would be, just as here, and when to harvest them. They could choose. They depended not on chance, but on policy. Licence punging is a template. Here are two more, which I've chosen from opposite edges of the continent. You can readily locate uh, this uh, place today. It's Eugen von Gerard's The Crater of Mount uh, Eccles, painted in 1858. And you can stand where he stood, stood and recognise this scene. If you have a look here, at, at that, that is a car park now. These rocks are still here. There's a little path into the lake there. This keyhole of the lake is, uh, is still clear. This rock face... should never trust technology, go back to talk and chalk. <laughs> anyway, there's a rock face up there and that is still here. You can see the keyhole, good. There's the car park, the rocks are in here. There's that rock face, there's a similar rock face over there. Now clearly, we're standing at about the same place as Von Gerard sat to paint. In fact, it's about three yards difference because there's too much scrub where he actually sat. But the vegetation, uh, the vegetation is very different. And I suggest to you uh, nothing like a natural distribution. Those grass strips, as we've just seen in the next uh, painting, are forest now. They're all forest. Um, but they've been deliberately made that way to make animals uh, abundant, convenient and predictable. Those grass lanes... Uh, where you'd fire, you'd use fire stick farming to burn a patch. You'd lure wallabies there a fortnight later once the grass has come up green. Uh, they have shelter on either side so they feel safe uh, in venturing out onto the grass. But hunters could uh, emerge from those uh, grass strips, uh, for, sorry, forest strips and ambush them. If uh, they ran uphill, which is most likely for uh, kangaroos and wallabies. They'd hit that rock face. If they were forced downhill, they'd be run into the water and they'd be even at a greater disadvantage. So there's a beautifully made uh, strip and as you can see, there are similar patterns on the outside of that crater of Mount Eccles. Obviously, you've got to do it more than one place because after you hunt kangaroos, they move on. And then this is 
by the surveyor James J. Cobham, a survey plan south of Cowie Point on Cape York, drawn in 1891. You can just see, I think, the original aspect components of his sur survey plan. Um, and I've touched up in colour uh, uh, other lines that he drew. I haven't changed anything. That's exactly how it is, but I've just coloured in the key vegetation uh, features. Green is rainforest and white is open eucalypt forest. Now, Cobbin had to certify on honour. He had to sign a certification on honour that this plan was accurate. And yet, every vegetation type is on every terrain. You've got rainforest along the coast, or what he called vine scrub, or dense scrub on, on that plan. And that's screening camps on the beach from hunting grounds inland. That vine scrub follows uh, creeks, but not al always. In fact, in this southern screen, you can see high up is vine forest, rainforest, and lower down is uh, eucalypt forest. That's exactly what the reverse of what you'd expect because rainforest obviously grows much more readily on the uh, lower ground, the richer ground, the more watered ground and so on. So the, the natural distribution, if I could put it that way, has been reversed there. And then look at that swamp, that yellow uh, patch towards uh, the top centre top of the, of the image. Um, obviously a swamp has the same levels all around and yet half of the border is uh, rainforest and half of it is eucalypt forest. Now that uh, template, that distribution of eucalypt forest, well grassed as Cobbin said, led early Europeans to think uh, that this would be good cropland, usually for tobacco. But without repeated fire, this land becomes dense rainforest, and that's what it is now. If you care to look at Cowie Point, C-O-W-I-E, on Google Earth, you'll see that this is very dense rainforest. The two factors blended to make templates like this one. One, ecological, the other, religious. Ecologically, laying out country variably to suit and balance all other species meant undeviating commitment to very intricate land management. Individual inclination and enterprise must be curbed and ecological rules and knowledge must reach beyond living generations. The law, which I interpret as a religious uh, philosophy rooted in ecology, compelled this. Across Australia, it taught that every living thing had at least one totem derived from a creator ancestor, otherwise it can't exist. Even life that Europeans introduced, rabbits and camels, uh, houseflies, a uh, flu, they have a totem and every totem has people who belong to it and at the risk of their souls must care for it. Emu people must care for emu and emu habitat and emus and emu habitat must care for them and so on. Rules and myths and ceremonies about the sanctity of totems, including fire, warned and instructed until the consequences of disobeying were too terrible to contemplate. So totems thus protected diversity and enforced conformity via religious sanction, the most powerful possible in any society. Evidence for this intricate fusion of law and ecology exists in enough dispersed places to say that the whole continent was a single estate, in other words, unified by the Aboriginal mind. People went further. They made land beautiful. After bush, a word that uh, the first colonists brought from South Africa, the most common word that newcomers used to describe the landscape was park. It's a striking park, a word, because Europe's parks were made. They deliberately associated water, grass and trees in picturesque array. Few of them were public in 1788. Most were the preserve and mark of royalty or gentry. In other words, they signified wealth and leisure. 
Yet newcomers from these very places frequently compared Australia with them. In Port Jackson on the 26th of January 1788, Arthur Bowes Smythe rejoiced at the beautiful and novel appearance of the different coves and islands as we sailed up. The finest terraces, lawns and grottos with distinct plantations of the tallest and most stately trees I ever saw in any nobleman's grounds in England cannot excel in beauty those which nature now presented to our view. In November 1826, uh, Robert Dawson thought the country inland from Port Stephens truly beautiful. It was thinly studded with single trees as if planted for ornament. It is impossible, therefore, to pass through such a country without being perpetually reminded of a gentleman's park and grounds. The first idea is that of an inhabited and improved country combined with the pleasurable associations of a civilised society. Port Stephens has just had those terrible uh, fires through thick scrub, hasn't it? In Tasmania, John Hudspeth uh, praised the beautiful and rich valley of Jericho, more like a gentleman's park in England, laid out with taste than land in its natural state. W.H. Lee thought the country south of Adelaide a wild but beautiful park which reminded one of the domain of an English noble. And I could go on. There are hundreds of similar remarks uh, from across Australia. And yet, even when they saw parks, most newcomers still thought the land natural. It's nature in, in the state of nature, as husband said. They assumed that primitive hunter-gatherers lacked the skill and inclination to make parks. And yet a clue was there in that observation that fire made fresh grass to lure kangaroos, which some early settlers certainly saw. At Lille Works, works on golf greens today, for example, as I'm sure you know, where kangaroos prefer to risk flying golf balls and angry greenkeepers to get at the fresh growth, even though there's longer and safer grass only metres away. Now let's explore this uh, lure with grey or forested kangaroos such as Lysit depicted. To attract them with fire, you've got to ensure that they go where you've burnt, obviously. So you must make sure the grass you burn is the sweetest and most nutritious available. You've got to take care not to burn other grass too close and you've got to provide shelter nearby so kangaroos won't feel vulnerable. To ensure that the grass you burn is the sweetest and most nutritious available, you've got to put it on the best soil. If it's not on the best soil, the kangaroos will go elsewhere. But trees grow on such soil, so you must burn to keep it permanently clear of trees, or at least most trees. And yet, kangaroos shelter among trees, so you must provide them, neither too open, so the kangaroos feel exposed, nor too dense, so they fear being slowed down. So beside the grass, you must have open forest and perhaps beyond it, a dense forest to shepherd the roos back towards the grass. In other words, you must make not only the grass, but the land around using at least three distinct fire regimes and probably more. Now, there's no point in doing all this just in one place because after you hunt kangaroos, they move. You must lure them to the next place you've prepared and then the next and the next and so on. In short, you must pattern the whole country into places which will and won't shepherd kangaroos, uh, grey kangaroos, if you want to farm them successfully. Now think of all the other marsupials, red kangaroos, wallabies, potteroos, bedongs and so on. Of course, not all in the same area, but each with their habitat preferences. Think of all the other plants, animals, birds, reptiles and insects which flourished when Europeans arrived. All had their place, all had food and shelter which suited them. Many are now gone or going. To accommodate such diversity, you've got to set up a great variety of templates. Of course, some species find uh, a home in more than one template. Possums is the most obvious example for city people, I think, but others don't. Uh, spinifex and mulga, rainforest and bladygrass, uh, 
eucalypts and tussock grass with bulbs and tubers, uh, mangroves, reeds and other water plants. They've all got to be laid out. And given how long some trees in particular live, this might take centuries to set up. Templates for the same purpose could be close, but when activated had to be far enough apart not to disrupt each other, obviously, as this would make target animals unpredictable and the system pointless. So activating a template, template meant negotiating with neighbours and totem elders. The law prescribed most of this, but still negotiation must have been constant. So the template system could hardly have had land boundaries. When you think about it, there couldn't be a place where it was practised and next to it a place where it wasn't. A place where uh, neighbours negotiated continuously next to a place where they behaved randomly. In that sense too, Australia was inexorably a, a, a single estate. Once you have skilled and detailed uh, managers careful of their own country and of their neighbour's country, the system flows to the boundaries of the, of the sea and beyond. This system was much more than merely sustainable. That's, uh, it's a European word, isn't it? It always evokes in my mind people just with their nose above water, just stopping themselves from drowning. Uh, the Aboriginal word is abundant, not sustainable. And their system was more than sustainable. Possibly even in hard times, it was so abundant that people may normally have harvested only resources made surplus by expanding off their templates. You know, as a if animals get too many, then they start to spread. And it's those spreading animals that uh, Aborigines may have concentrated on harvi harvesting. That sort of abundance was possible because people had plenty of land. So they could let plants and animals recover undisturbed. Mobility was thus a great advantage. For centuries, Europeans have used mobility as a means of condemning hunter-gatherers, haven't they? But I say it was a great advantage. Whereas farming licensed population growth, mobility curbed it. Whereas farming drove people out of marginal land, mobility let them prosper there. People did not have to stay by their crops and no livestock, no beast of burden anchored them. Donald Thompson noted that Arnhem Land clans spent uh, several months mobile and several months sedentary each year, but each period was equally planned and predictable. It was, he said, a regular and orderly annual cycle carried out systematically and with a rhythm parallel to and in step with the seasonal changes. The nomadic movements of these people can be forecast with accuracy and their camps foretold with reasonable certainty. Phyllis Carberry thought mobility, abundance and predictability let Kimberley women work less hard than farmers' wives and yet get food more certainly. She said it's not the steady, strenuous labour of the German peasant woman, Phyllis was German, of the German peasant woman bending from dawn to dusk over her fields, hoeing, weeding, sowing and reaping. The Aboriginal, Aboriginal woman has greater freedom of movement and more variety. The agriculturalists may be left destitute and almost starving if the crops fail or are destroyed by drought, flood, fire, locusts or grasshoppers as sometimes happens in China and in Europe. I never saw an Aboriginal woman come in empty handed though in 1935 there was a drought. She concluded women's work compares favourably with the European eight hour day and of course very few European farmers are lucky enough to have an eight hour day. Geoffrey Blaney pointed out that people work many fewer hours a day to secure food and shelter than farmers anywhere. Now perhaps neither author carried, uh, counted fire or ritual as work, but only people untroubled about food could have held so many ceremonies. Of course there were hungry times or people mightn't have managed their uh, resources so carefully, but it was not the norm. People were not hinging on uncertainty or toil. On the contrary, 
they could afford to host hundreds of guests, sometimes for months. This required setting aside big stretches of country for years ahead to build up food, and yet such occasions were common. Abundant resources are also attested by how much spare time people had. Europeans uh, often complained, and some still complain, that Aborigines were lazy, that they sat around for hours uh, talking, uh, dancing or singing, even in broad daylight. Today, many outsiders think the most distinctive uh, features of Aboriginal society relate to art or corroboree. In other words, to what Europeans think is leisure. In fact, much of this is work. It's planning or performing to keep country and future alive, but only a well-ordered society could afford so much time away from the food quest. When you look at a film of Aboriginal people performing corroborees, you're looking at people who are not anxious about where their next meal is coming from. Really, the best parallel for Aboriginal society in 1788 is Europe's gentry. So it's not surprising that newcomers thought the land so often like a gentleman's park. Those parks have gone. Stopping fire, let trees grow. Near Harndorf in the Adelaide Hills in midsummer 1839, Dirk Hahn saw people burning in the Onkaparinga Valley. They form a circle about 20 English miles in diameter, light fires around this area and then direct the fire closer and closer in towards the centre of this circle. That's quite a trick. The long dry grass, bushes and young trees burn fiercely. All the animals living in this area flee towards the centre where the savages then capture them. The fire burned for some days. I had never before seen such a fire. He's just come from Europe. In the same valley, Hahn saw the result of such a fire. Beautifully formed trees, which nature had planted there as if with the hands of a gardener. Every tree stood about 40 feet apart from the others. Some were perhaps an acre apart, so that the land could be excuse me, cultivated without uprooting a single tree. I found grass a metre high. They looked like our European cornfields. Here's that valley uh, 30 years later. This is William Rodolph Thomas, Aboriginal family group on the Onkaparinga River near Harndorf in 1870. You can see those scattered big trees that Hahn admired and they're like that Mount Nash, aren't they? They're spread, confirming that they grew in the open. But there are no cornfields now. There's only scrub rapidly filling in the ground between. This ruin... This ruin is what many think Southern Australia was like when Europeans arrived. And they think that because the southeast colonies passed their key closest settlement acts in the 1860s and, and then a whole lot of new settlers came onto the land. And this 1870 scene conveys what those selectors faced. No parks by then, but decades of backbreaking axe work. 30 years earlier, it would have been much easier. And of course, 100 axes are not nearly as efficient as one controlled fire. This is Frederick McCubbin, down on his luck. I chose it for two reasons. It's not an especially good example, uh, but uh, for two reasons. First of all, it's well known. And secondly, uh, I want to suggest to you that you can walk into any gallery with uh, Australian colonial art and in it detects signs of Aboriginal presence. Here you can see regenerating she-oaks and wattles uh, recapturing grassland. Gums in the front right corner, uh, casuarinas or she-oaks across the centre ground, wattles uh, just behind the, the big tree on the left. So they're recapturing what was grass and that's just what you'd expect of southeast land that's released from fire. Only one tree is older than about 1840 when newcomers occupied this district and that's that big stringy bark on the left and you can see its trunk is partly blackened from fire. So only one tree, so this was once woodland, quite open woodland. Now, or very shortly, the axe is going to have to work. The pioneer legend 
rightly honours the selectors, the hardy men and women who carved homes from the dense bush, but that is not how most land was in 1788. So I'll just finish up. Uh, to locate and rest resources, that template system needed big areas free of people, while allying with fire required a mobile population with few fixed assets. A scant and scattered population made 1788 Australia vulnerable to invasion, but this should not mask how impressive the Aboriginal achievement was. To balance land and people so richly and sustainably for so long across so great an area ranks among humanity's great achievements. No other world civilization managed it. Almost all turned from hunter-gathering to agriculture and thence in time to a bad end or an uncertain future such as ours. Aborigines never joined the agrarian world's race to a complex technology. There are instances of farming in 1788, plenty of them, but people were never likely to convert to it. Fire gave too many advantages. It let people fuse the ecology and religion of an entire continent into the biggest estate on earth, and instead of dividing Aborigines into gentry and peasantry, it made them a free people. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Sorry, what was that? Okay, okay two questions. One is, um, is there places where these fire ages have been continuous? Like, for example, in Arnhem Land or in um, the Maori country in West Australia? In West Australia. And the Maori question is, um, I was thinking about the big struggle that used to exist at the rainforest between, say, uh, you know, Brisbane and Mount Grafton. It was pretty, like, it was systematically big forest. On the f first question, whether there's uh, any place that uh, has continuous traditional Aboriginal burning, I don't think so. Um, there's been continuous burning in the centre of north and north, uh, both in the Spinifex and the rainforest, but under European management, by and large, that burning has been for cattle. And that's very different burning. Uh, you're much readier to clear off all the grass and to pay no attention to uh, clumps of trees and the like, which may happen to be standing in the way of such a fire, whereas Aboriginal people would take great care to protect those clumps first by back burning and burning in the cool time of the year and so on. Cattle burning basically wants to get a very hot fire to clear off as much of the old grass as possible. Uh, Aborigines did burn in the hot season, but uh, most of their burns were cool burns, which left patches or mosaics, as I was saying. As for the rainforest, um, it's, f it's quite clear that rainforest has uh, um, increased dramatically since 1788. There's much more rainforest than there was, and uh, including where you're talking about. The best evidence for that is to go along Tasmania or the east coast of Australia and you can see giant eucalypts in places overtopping the rainforest. Rainforest underneath, eucalypts above. But no young eucalypts, for a very good reason. Young eucalypts don't grow in rainforest. There's no light. As I said at the beginning, eucalypts chase light. There's none in rainforest, so they don't flourish there. And the obvious question is, how did those big eucalypts get there? Uh, and the obvious answer is because there was no rainforest. So it's clear evidence uh, that Rainforest is expanding. Any other questions? So I have one. In, 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 in relation to the diversity of animals, you 
think that the, the, the file system helped in increasing the, the biodiversity of those animals at that time? Uh, the question whether fire impacted adversely on uh, animals. There, there are some animals who would have been uh, disadvantaged by Aboriginal fire because it destroyed so much nutrient. I mean, basically, the major nutrient under Aboriginal fire management is ash rather than humus because it's burnt. But the totem system and therefore the law requires people to have a habitat for every plant and animal. Not just the big ones, not the obvious ones. A um, friend of mine in Alice Springs, Winton, he uh, comes from uh, what's called Burtwell, north of Alice Springs. He called his totem the, the maggot totem. That is the sawfly grubs and uh, uh, maggots and other grubs and his job was to make sure that their habitat was looked after, that they had a place. So he could, if people were burning country uh, that was uh, disadvantageous to, to the maggots, he could stop them doing it. So if you can imagine that maggots have a, a protector, and not only one, a whole totem, then clearly everything else does too. It's really important. Well, I remember, uh, as I'm sure a lot of us did, uh, seeing on television in the winter after those February 2009 fires, a lot of TV coverage of the country coming back. People, new, uh, news reporters saying how good it looked now, it was all nice and green and recovering. That would have been the time to burn. You burn straight away. Once, if you've got mountain ash, for example, if you have a fire that goes through it, straight away you keep fire at it. And, and in that way you can burn clearings and safety zones, we'd call them now, paths, ways to get out of the ash forest if it does catch up. And you keep that up for the 400 odd years while the mountain ash grows, grows up around you. So that, that sort of method uh, is one thing. Another thing, I had a time bomb in just a passing comment when I said in no undergrowth. Scrub is, scrub is crucial to fire control. Scrub is what lifts small flames up into canopies of big trees and that produces the killer fires because they race across the top. Aboriginal people knew that and they had large areas uh, without any undergrowth. That's why they look like parks because it was grass and trees and nothing in between. So we could do much more to control scrub in that way. Not everywhere, of course, because it's, it's a habitat. The plants and the animals in it have to have their place, but you make sure there are places which are relatively confined and uh, therefore can't burn out vast areas of country. Really, we should learn much more from Aboriginal people about fire. The fact that we can't stop our own cities being burnt must be a national disgrace. I mean, what country should t happily put up with its own citizens being destroyed every summer? It's ridiculous. Well, they certainly deprive native animals of habitat. Uh, there are a few native animals that can manage in uh, pine forests, possums and birds, parrots. 
Uh, but basically they're depriving people of habitat, yeah. On the other hand, we, we use pine a lot, we use softwoods a lot. You know, we're not a society as well geared as Aboriginal society to looking after country. That's one of the problems that we have. I'd say uh, we can learn a lot from Aboriginal people, but I don't think we can go entirely back to 1788. I mean, we're too many for a start, too arrogant, think we know everything, so we won't do it.